Welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. Monday Night Raw with Triple H in charge is starting to show its colors. And we had a lot happen on Monday night that was very Triple H-esque, though not without its faults. WWE has still some of those traditional issues, but overall a show that you could tell was run differently and not in a massive way, but very subtle ways. We're going to talk about that. Edge and his promo, Becky Lynch, her injury, all of it coming up right after this. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Says I just your ass. This is my honor. You're going to acknowledge me. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. We've got certainly a lot to get to here with Monday Night Raw. And look, this is a show that, as I said at the very beginning, that it had its bright spots. It had some things that you go, oh, that's cool. That's a little different. But it seems to have its core fundamental issues still remaining. Maybe some of that is due to the same personnel who are running the show, you know, until triple H or if he ever does clear house and bring in his own team, you're going to have a lot of similarities from show to show from a production standpoint, from a creative standpoint. That's not to say triple H isn't going to implement himself more and more as we move forward. I hope that's the case, but if you still have Kevin Dunn in charge of production you st- if you still have uh, you know Bruce Pritchard in any capacity involved in creative, you, know, you have the same team. You just have a different leader, and that doesn't mean you're going to have necessarily overall different results, but rather subtle changes. So that's what we saw on Monday night, and I thought that overall it was a decent show in Houston. But I have to say that you know the the, the fundamental issues that remain are still problematic with logic and things like that. And uh, the edge baby face turn that I still don't, don't agree with at all, but we got some really good wrestling. We got a focus, uh, a really heavy focus on the United States championship. That's a great thing because without a world championship on raw triple H said to himself, Hey, let's put a real heavy focus on the United States championship. That is our, essentially our top belt, until they bring the uh, some kind of world championship back to Raw, that is our 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 top championship for the guys to compete for. And what I really really liked about this was they actually created a video package for the United States Championship itself. It wasn't about Bobby Lashley. It wasn't about anyone in particular. It was about the championship, its heritage, its legacy, its respect, who's held it, what it's meant. And then Bobby had his own promo to talk about it and say how much respect he or how much, how he wants to bring respect back to that championship. Just a really nice focus, or I guess a renewed focus, a renewed attention, a renewed attention, renewed education on the United States championship that I think needed it because it's to me it's always been the redheaded stepchild to the Intercontinental Championship uh, and. I'm glad that they, they did that excellent video package, and I hope they do the same thing for the, in the IC belt on SmackDown. I know Gunther is holding it, but I think a a, a duplicate type of uh, duplicate type of uh, a video package for the Intercontinental Championship is a great idea for SmackDown. If you don't have the World Championship to compete for, because Roman has locked in from pay per view to pay per view. And he's seeing WWE is at least in the short term not going to put a championship on Raw. Then you certainly have to take and, and just really maximize what you have, and that is those mid card belts that the workers, the workmen's championship. You have to do the most with what you have, and those championships are the top belts that that WWE has right now, at least on a consistent basis. So. I really like that. And uh, before I go any further, I thank you so much for joining us here on the WWE podcast. We produce a show every single day, nearly. And I appreciate everybody who's joined us over the SummerSlam weekend. Many of you have. If you haven't already, check us out on Patreon for a dollar. 
$1 gets you in the door for all of our ad-free shows. And you can go up in tiers and see video as well, uh, as well as other benefits like coming on the show. If you get up to the $10 tier, you have a option to come on the show and host a uh, show with me of your choice, whether it's Raw or whether it's The Weekend Review. And a lot of other cool stuff, including merch. If you go higher than that, there's merchandise, including T-shirts and mugs and stuff for this show. And I really would appreciate you guys if you want to support the show. It's a good way to do it. And also, one other thing I really want to promote heavily, and I, and I really hope you guys join us here, because the DuPont Network, which is DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T dot com, uh, or actually DuPontNow.com, rather, is where you can find me every Saturday night for a one hour long show that I do weekly that airs there, only there, no YouTube, no anywhere else. And I cover the week's events. And this week, especially I'll record it tomorrow night and it'll air on Saturday. I'm going to be covering raw, but really also smacked or uh, SummerSlam. And, and there's so much to talk about with SummerSlam, so much to talk about with raw and moving forward to clash at the castle. It's going to be a jam packed show. Things that maybe I come up with on the show and you, that you hear only there and not on this feed. So Go and support the DuPont Network. It's DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T, now.com. They also have not just myself, but it's also a bunch of other content creators and free live TV, TV shows that you guys know and love for 100% free. Go sign up. There's no hidden fees, nothing, totally free. And I'd encourage you to go check out the DuPont Network at DuPontNow.com. So, all right, let's move on and uh, let's get into the show. Becky Lynch opened the show. She had an, uh, a promo and had her arm in a sling. She has, I guess, uh, completely taken away her uh, her obnoxious outfits and maybe stopped shopping at the same place as her husband <laughs> while she's babyface. And she said that she suffered a legitimate separated shoulder at SummerSlam with Bianca. And it happened early in the match because the majority of the match she had to wrestle with a separated shoulder. She said how painful that was. I, I believe this is legitimate. And she cut a decent babyface promo and, you know, saying that she found her true self and all this stuff. Very, you know, Edge kind of had a similar vibe. Edge and Becky turning back babyface kind of had the sick, you know, it, the promo was cut from the same cloth, so to speak. And, you know, I, I bought into Lynch's promo. I bought it into it more than I did Edge, I have to say. But, uh, you know, people, the thing is, people didn't want to hate Becky to begin with. I don't think that you could look back at this past year for Becky and say, hey, that was a very that was a total success. Great move by WWE, WWE turning her heel when she returned. I actually would look at this and go, it was a me, the kind of a mediocre, uh, mediocre run as a heel. You look at this and go, meh. Like she had her moments when people hated her, but in general, people still had that underlying feeling of we really don't want to boo you. Like can we can we just put you back where you belong? And WWE did. So they tried it for a year, and. The, it didn't it generally didn't work it wasn't a total flop but it just people don't want to hate her so uh, after this though after she cut her promo bel-air came out and the two complimented each other and they hugged and lynch told bel-air to hold things down that she'd see her soon Be becky lynch left the ring and after becky was gone bel-air was talking and the cameras cut to backstage where bailey eo sky and dakota kai were attacking becky lynch and her already injured arm before heading, you know, fleeing the scene when Belair was trying to get her hands on them. And yeah, you know, they, they were, you know, here's the one thing I like, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show with little things that triple H has done that you don't see often. And I think triple H is responsible for this, that the camera wasn't right there for the attack to happen. Like the cameras had to rush to the scene, little things like that make it feel more authentic than having just by happenstance, a camera happens to be everywhere. And so that is just a little thing like that, whether it was intentional or not, makes it feel more real. And so after this, we got Bailey, Sky, and Dakota Kai uh, said the attack wasn't about Lynch or Belair, but it was about putting themselves, it was about themselves and promising to show how they were going to dominate the women's division. And hey, uh, this is a statement, right? And this is their, their beloved, quote unquote, statement to the women's division. Like Bailey, I think, is doing a nice job for the short term time that they've been doing this, which is like two shows. But I'd like a name for this group. I mean, I'd love, I'd love a name for this group. I don't know what that could be. I don't have suggestions off the top of my head. But I think that there needs to be a name. 
Maybe the submission sorority. I'm joking. Those of you, okay, I either hear crickets or those of you are who get it, get it. Uh, it was Paige's group several years ago that was named at one point the submission sorority until they realized that there's an adult site that may in, indeed be the same exact name. <laughs> so I, I would say the submission sorority is a very safe bet not to happen. But um, all right. So Alexa Bliss and Asuka then had a matchup, very competitive, friendly matchup, babyface, babyface. I didn't see Lily. That's a plus. I could be wrong. Maybe I missed the intro, or but I, I don't. I think Lily has finally been put to rest. Maybe six feet under, hopefully. And the match was okay, fine. You know, it's nice to see Alexa in actual competition. But this was spoiled when Bailey, Sky, and, and uh, Dakota Kai attack these women. Belair ran in to make the save and demanded a match with one of them. She didn't care who. Later in the night, now we knew it wasn't going to be Bailey. So it's either going to be Io Sky or Dakota Kai. Definitely, you're not, you 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 have to go with the minions first, right? It's it's just like it's uh just typical Hollywood, especially '80s villain movie storyline where you have to get through each level of success uh, succession from the peons in the evil organization all the way to like the right hand man, and then you finally get to the the ringleader. That's the way it's going to be here with Bailey. And Alexa, or rather, uh, Bianca faced EO Sky, but it end, that ended in a no contest. So this is the, the second no contest in a row when Bailey and Dakota Kai began to brawl with Bliss and Asuka in the ring. And then Bliss and Asuka came to ringside mid-match to even the odds for Bel Air, and the inevitable brawl broke out. And uh, that's pretty much it. Now, th- the clean finish didn't happen here for both matches, and... Part of me wants to just knee jerk react and go, oh, here we go with the no contest, the no finish. There's no clean finish. But this actually makes sense. With Asuka and, and Alexa, you want you can't really afford either woman to really lose right now. Plus, well, I guess you could, but more importantly, they're both baby faces. And you want them to be continue to be baby faces. And it was a throwaway match anyway, because the whole purpose of this was just to establish Bailey Sky and Dakota Kai as a threat. The overall arching, the overall dark cloud in the women's division that they could attack anyone at any time. And that's the purpose. That was the whole purpose of the match, which was that's the reason it was a cold match. There's no reason for Asuka Alexa Bliss. They were just there and they put them together. They had a quick five, 10 minute match, which just was the purpose of this was just to establish Bailey's faction. So I'm fine with that. So I give that a pass. And then the Bianca EO Sky ending in a no contest also makes sense because there's chaos, right? Like, uh, you know, Bliss and Asuka came to the ring mid-match to even the odds, and then the brawl broke out, and the referee had no choice because they were trying to get revenge for earlier in the night. So it makes sense. Um, th- this is actually okay. So, all right, let's move on. AJ Styles defeated Mustafa Ali and The Miz via pinfall after a Styles clash on Ali. The first of two triple threat matches here. The whole focus of these, they had two triple threat matches on Raw. The winners of those two triple threats would face each other later in the night. That person would face Bobby Lashley for a United States Championship match next week on Raw. So there's still a championship match that I still would like Triple H at some point to move championship matches back to pay-per-views. Because I think while he's trying to, on, on one side reestablish, reeducate, and renew a sense of respect and prestige to the United States Championship. At the same time, he's still having championship matches left and right on free TV. That, to me, is one of the sins of WWE that I know many people have moved on from and just have kind of, it's been normalized. To me, it's still something that should be reserved for pay-per-views only and very rarely on free TV. So right now, that's still something that's going on. I'm not a fan of it. That's just my own personal opinion. So... That said, the, this match was really good. Uh, th- this match, to me, over-delivered. And I sh- should I really be surprised, given the actual the, the talent in the ring here? I feel like I shouldn't be surprised, but I was. The Tornado DDT uh, by Ali on AJ outside the ring was insane. And normally, you wouldn't say a Tornado DDT is insane. Like we, A Tornado DDT is a fairly common move. It's not something that you look at and go, oh, my God, it's like a pile driver. No. It's fairly common. You know, it happens maybe once a show, uh, but it's something that I, the reason it's in, it was incredible is 
the way that it was delivered was it was almost like it was in fast forward. It was like lightning speed by Ali on AJ. Absolutely just so quick. And it looked so devastating that I actually was looked at AJ and worried that they were going to put up the X sign that he was injured. And he didn't, thank goodness. And But wow, did that look brutal. That that tornado DDT was delivered perfectly, and I'm glad AJ's okay. So uh, the, also the, the ending of the match, the Styles clash on Ali on The Miz laying on the mat was really cool, and AJ wins the matchup and goes on to face the winner of the, fa- the, the, the subsequent triple threat, which we'll get to. So... Good stuff there. This match over delivered in a big way. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, we get next is Seth Rollins defeating Montez Ford via pinfall after hitting a stomp. The Street Profits interrupted a Rollins promo about his intention to go after Roman Reigns and played rock, paper, scissors over who would face Rollins with Ford grabbing a referee and running to the ring to cheat Angelo Dawkins out of the opportunity. Dawkins still saved Ford after the match by preventing Rollins from his continued attack. So this, again, it's it just a continuation of the possible split with the Street Profits. And I am all for it. And I think that this, to me, is is a beautiful thing for Montez Ford. I'm not a Dawkins fan really on any level. I mean, in the ring, he's he's you know, he does things he shouldn't do at his size. And just because he can do them doesn't mean he should. You know, everyone has felt like they have to adhere to this flip-flop fly, suicide dive, you know, flips over the ropes, and, you know, all that stuff. It feels like no matter what size you are, it's almost irrelevant that everyone wrestles the same way. And I think that's a huge mistake because then it feels all the same. And when it feels all the same, it takes away from the I guess the uniqueness of each person in the match and there are certain styles that they, they do. Everyone's kind of conformed to this, like just kind of group think or consensus on this is how you wrestle. And these are the moves you should do regardless of your size. And I don't agree with that. You know, Dawkins is a big man. He should wrestle like a big man. You know, I felt the same way with big E, you know, when big E was doing suicide dives through the middle rope, he did, he's done them like a hundred times. More than that. And and I just, every time he does it, I cringe. Not because he's doing them poorly, but because of two reasons. Number one, he doesn't have to do them. And number two, there's a much higher risk of injury when you have a man that size doing something like that. It just doesn't, and and three, you also take away the uniqueness that you could bring to the match by not wrestling like everyone else and doing the same moves as everyone else. So for some reason, everyone just has just landed on this conclusion that you have to do these moves. I don't care what size you are. And and it's just, it's not, a, I'm not a fan. So anyway, uh, the, the biggest point of this was, okay, Seth Rollins gets the victory and, and he says that he's going after Roman Reigns. I love it. I love it. Could Seth actually be the next opponent for Roman? Could he finally be the one to end the streak? Because I honestly don't think Drew's going to do it at Clash at the Castle. There's a possibility, and I have said, and I'll stick by it, that out of the two years Roman Reigns has been champion, this is the first time that you look at it and go, okay, there's a real possibility because Drew's believable. He's believable in, in, in on, on every level to be the guy to end Roman Reigns. But, but... The fact that Seth has now declared he's going after Roman has told me that he's getting Drew is not going to win and that the next person in line is Seth. And now Seth is also a real possibility. So it seems as if if those of you that are tired of the Roman Reigns run and I'm with you, I'm tired of it, too. But now we're starting to get into the part of Roman Reigns run where you could actually make the case for Roman losing. Instead of just looking at it going, yeah, it's going to be a good match, I'm sure, but Roman wins. We've essentially been saying that for two years. That's a, that's really what it's been is not really who's going to win, but how good is the match going to be? Now we can look at it and go, the match is probably going to be really good because you have Drew and Seth. I mean, those are top level A plus talent, but you can also say the ending, the conclusion, the victor is now actually in jeopardy. So we're starting to get to the fun part of this 
this run from Roman, as you'd imagine, it's it's running to its conclusion. It's running to the very end of the rope here. And I know Triple H is he has a much better sense, I think, than Vince did of what the fans want, or at least maybe going with what the fans want rather than Vince's ego thinking he knows better than the fans. So with Triple H having more of a reactionary, not knee jerk, but I think a more, I don't know what the word is, sympathetic or pitiful view of the fans and what they want. I don't know what it is. That's not the right words, but uh, it feels like Triple H is trying to make a good impression right off the bat. He wants to send a good message to the fans that I hear you. He wants to send a message to the fans. I understand your concerns. And what better way to do that than to quickly end Roman Reigns' run? At least put one championship on Raw and have Roman retain the Universal, and you can have your Universal run all the way to a 1,000 days, and you can also put a championship on Raw. I've said that a million times. So I think that's hopefully what Triple H does at Clash, at the Castle, or the next pay-per-view in October, which, is it in Saudi Arabia? I think it is. Is it, is it Crown Jewel? Sadly, I think it is. And then it's Survivor Series. So Seth may not get Roman until Survivor Series, given that last year's Survivor Series, what happened. So it'd be a, a nice symmetry. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. In the, in the short term, Seth did declare that he's going after Roman. I love that. But also this furthered the split with Montez and Angela, which is a big positive because Montez is a massive star in the, in the making and Dawkins is insufferable. So I can't wait. I'll say that. Okay. Champa then defeated Gable and Ziggler in a second triple threat to face AJ Styles for a shot at the United States Championship. And Champa had a really good night. <laughs> I mean, you know, what? hold on. I have something to say about that. So I'm pausing myself until we get to the AJ Styles and Champa match. But the triple threat here was also really good. All three men. <laughs> All of them, amazing uh, wrestlers from Gable to Ziggler to Champa. I mean, my goodness. And some of the, the, I don't think it was as good as the first triple threat with Styles, Ali, and Miz, but I think that it delivered in a way that you'd expect. You know, it wasn't super long, but it, it held its own and they had some some fun spots. And uh, Champa with the um, his finish, what, what do they call it? Like the, f- f- I can't think, it starts with an F. Um, Fantasyland or something? I'm saying it wrong. Anyway, uh, Champa's finish. I love how it looks like a pedigree, and then it's not. <laughs> um, but I, I enjoyed Champa winning here. I think that it was a great way to reestablish him from being the guy that just attacked people from behind at random with no voice to, to winning this matchup. And AJ Styles and Champa put on a, a, a really good match as well. I mean, oh, the fairy tale ending. That's what it's called, not fantasy. Fairy tale ending is the name of Champa's finish. And. AJ and Champa had a, I mean, my God, a really good match. And to be honest, that's the first time I can remember that Champa has actually spoken or had a real promo on the main roster. That was the first time I remember hearing that. And he cut a good promo. And uh, Miz was there, of course, in support of Champa. And uh, he interfered several times in this match and allowed Champa to score the victory with fairy tale ending. So AJ loses to Champa. AJ had Champa beat, but Miz put uh, with, with the AJ hit Styles Clash on Champa, and then the Miz put Champa's foot on the rope. So the referee had to break the count. But in the end, Miz did and was the deciding factor in this, allowing Champa to win. And that means that Champa and AJ, or rather Champa and Bobby Lashley, are happening next week for the U.S. title. But what I wanted to get to with Champa is under the toolage of Vince McMahon or the guidance or the head of creative events, you had Champa as a guy that was a, a mute, never talked, didn't have any direction, just was randomly attacking people from behind with no, just just lost, just doing things at random. And in, in one single week, he has a good promo and he has two matches. And he has a championship match next week under Triple H. Like that. Now, if that's not Triple H's fingerprints, I don't know what is. There are certain things you can point to and go, "Mm, maybe or probably not. It's probably a Vince McMahon carryover. This is Triple H 100 percent because in NXT, Triple H was very high on Champa, very high. And he even said if he was ever to come out of retirement, 
which we know is not possible because of his health. But if he could, that he would want to face Champa in an actual match. And, you know, that that's speaking very highly of Champa. So I think Triple H saw that and said, yeah, we're changing this, Vince, and put Champa in a very prominent position, getting a U.S. title match next week. Do I think he's going to win? Probably not. Probably not. But I wouldn't put it past him. Like, I, I, you know, what? I'd say it's like a 50-50 shot that Champa wins next week. So amazing from a week to week when Vince is in charge and then Triple H takes over. Bam. Champa gets a promo and two matches and a championship match next week. It's amazing. And I have no complaints. So, uh, okay. The Edge promo. Now, so many things here. From Edge, first of all, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's just worth mentioning quickly. Him leaving the Judgment Day was a really stupid move by creative. It probably wouldn't have happened under, under Triple H. We don't know. And for everyone thinking that everything good that they like on TV is Triple H's responsibility and everything that's bad is still a, a Vince McMahon uh, carryover, I don't think that's true. You know, everything good that you like on TV can't be just get all the credit can't be given to Triple H and all the blame given to Vince. You know, like, that, that can't happen. You know, at this point, you have to look at it and go, this is Triple H's product now. So, but this promo from Edge was fine it was okay but edge came out with his music his old music it's it's admittedly one of the best baby faces songs of all time it's very energetic it's it's a very memorable it's sing-along it's good stuff it's nostalgic and edge is still at the top of his game but he came out and i'm like really we're, we're going back here and they ditched the music from SummerSlam, which i agree with because that music with SummerSlam was really bad it, it was kind of a brood mix of just like it was just it's just wasn't my favorite. So they put him back with the old music. They put him back in kind of his old role, except shorter hair. And he came out with his, you know, his, his jacket and kind of the way he looked beforehand. And he, his, his entire uh, message to us was that he's going to end the judgment day, that he's going to kill what he, be, he started. He, however, did note a couple of things. He said that... Oh, I've been kind of an a-hole, except actually said the word a-hole. There's your uh, maybe wink and nod to TV 14. If that's not if that's TV PG, I mean, that's not TV PG, I got to say. But he he admitted, oh, I've been an a-hole. It's like, yeah, and we love it. So what, stop it, <laughs> you know. Um, but then he goes on and talks about how, you know, uh, he he started something and it ended quickly, right? He he kind of alluded to to the fans of like, hey, he he's hearing us through the promo saying that you know he didn't have a whole lot of time in the group. He did say something to that effect in the promo, you know, acknowledging the fact that he didn't have a ton of time here in the group, and and that is one of the biggest things. Like, I don't mind the turn. I don't mind the turn by Finn and Damian. What I mind is how quickly it happened. Didn't have time to breathe. It just he created the group and then bam, they turned on him. It's like, what? <laughs> what? You guys had an awesome thing going. What the hell's happening here? So that is something that, you know, the, the promo, I, I didn't really buy. Edge is a great talker, but all of a sudden he's seen the light because his group turned on him. Wouldn't that actually make him more angry, more dangerous, more dark, more like evil? Like by having somebody turn on you, wouldn't that send you into a, even more of a spiral? Instead of seeing the light, you know, I just, I just don't buy it. I mean, I love Edge. It's I'm not blaming Adam, blaming Adam Copeland. I'm blaming Vince and Creative because they were the ones who were in charge at, at that time when they made that decision. Very poor decision. Very poor. And the fans have just you know re embraced him, and I understand why. He's likable. Uh, he's a guy that is, he's got a lot of respect. He's puts on really good matches. He cuts a plus promos. All that. So I think that's you know the reason they re-embraced him and and the fans knew eventually he'd go back to babyface but boy was it too soon, my God! Uh, by the way, guys, if you hear a noise in the background, I'm uh, I have people here who are totally gutting my bathroom and it's kind of loud. So bear with me if you hear that noise in the background. I I'm trying to drown it out the best I can. So okay. Uh, oh, and one other thing that I want to mention that I've heard about who who could be the one to take the belt off Roman. And I've alluded this, this to, to this too. Cody Rhodes. I've heard this a lot. I've heard that Cody Rhodes could be the one as that was essentially his mission statement 
on day one in WWE after WrestleMania saying that he wants to win the belt for his father, the belt that his dad could never win. And he wants to do it for his family. And we're all supposed to just suddenly get on board for it because, so I'm mentioning my dad, like get off the dusty train, Cody, for God's sakes. Uh, But that was his mission statement. And I think that's going to carry into whenever he returns, which I think could be in just a couple of months. Me personally, I haven't heard anything, but I think the nine month recovery that they gave us is way overestimated on purpose. So, but I, I've heard Cody Rhodes, but uh, the problem with that is Cody's going to, I think, face Rollins at some point or uh, upon his return, he has to face Rollins and you know, that may last another month or two and then, and then he'll get to Roman unless Rollins is champion in which Cody could beat Rollins for the championship. How about that? I like it. All right. So let's see. We've got the undisputed tag team championship match that ended the show. And this was between the Usos and the the Mysterios. Now, this was interesting to me. Now, the, the Usos hit Dominic with the 1D. After the match, the Judgment Day attacked the Mysterios. Edge's music hit. He ran to the ring. He fought, he fought off Finn and Damian. But before Edge could hit Balor with a spear, Rhea Ripley shoved Dominic in the way, causing Edge to spear Dominic. That, to me, is more than just Rhea saving Finn's backside. That, to me, is a sign. Because... When things, quote unquote, accidentally happen, there's miscommunications, there's cross ups, there's, you know, that kind of thing. There's more to it than just, oh, okay, no problem, man. I understand. I saw the tape. We're good. Right. <laughs> like that, that's, that's not the case. They're building this to something. And it's one of two things it's either Rhea and Edge are in cahoots, and Edge knew this was going to happen. This is still all a ploy, and Edge is still the leader of the group, and he'll come back to them. And that's the reason he purposefully speared Dominic, but he tried to make it look like he didn't because he told Rhea, hey, I'm going to try to go out there. I'm going to clear the ring. I'm going to try to spear Finn. And I want you to shove Dominic in front of him to make it look like an accident. It's possible. It's possible. And I know there's a lot of things that are you know, out of control and a lot of variables. And how could you get to that moment? But let's just play with just play this game with me. OK, that's option one. Option two, which I I don't know if I want more than option one because I love Edge as a heel. But actually, there's three options. Sorry, guys. There's two. That's option one. Option two is Dominic turns heel. Dominic turns heel because he gets mad at Edge, doesn't believe that he didn't do it on purpose, and he starts to get angry with his dad who maybe tries to calm him down and says, you know, plus Dominic lost the match and says, you didn't help me in the match. You weren't there for me. And then also get speared by Edge. There you go. So Dominic turns, finally joins the Judgment Day. But Edge actually did it by accident. Or three, which I'm on board for, both happen. Right? Both happen. Where Edge purposely did it, but tried to make it look like an accident. Dominic also turns heel, and both of them go to the Judgment Day. That, that's what I'd love. If there was a way to get to that, That's, to me, the best part. Like, turn Edge and Dominic both heel. Edge goes back as leader, mouthpiece of the group. You reignite what they had before. You can still do it. And then you have Dominic turn. I I, I would love it. And have both of them. Both of them on board. Both of them heel. Both of them in that group. And then you have a group reignited, reestablished, and reinvigorated with gasoline. And I, I would love it. So, to me, that's what I would do. Uh, of course, you know, maybe the fourth option is nothing happens, right? It's just a mix up and they move on. Yeah, I, I just said it's something they normally don't do, but it's possible. They just say, oh, Rhea saved her. And, you know, Dominic is just, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe he's uh, maybe he's on. Uh, he has to go back to school in September or whatever. You know, it is back to school for Dominic. So perhaps he's, uh, you know, getting ready for school and for he's only available for the next four weeks until the first week of September and. You know, then he has to get new shoes and a, a new uh, a new binder and a new backpack for uh, you know tenth grade. So, all right, so that uh, that covers Monday Night Raw, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I I don't mean to to cut everyone short. It was a it was a little shorter of a review than normal, but I uh, I'm just kind of 
ready for this SummerSlam closeout to, to begin. And tomorrow will be the mailbag show. So please send in your emails at realwpodcast at gmail.com or mailbag at wwepodcast.com. And you can also call in. So that, that call in number is in the, the description of our mailbag shows. And consider joining us on Patreon for a dollar a month at patreon.com slash WWE podcast. And don't forget, guys, there's that option to, to watch us for an hour long show video on DuPont, the D U P O N T network. So go to DuPontNow.com, sign up for free, and you can watch us every single Saturday night at eight o'clock, as well as you know, all the other shows they have for 100% no cost totally free and it's a great way to uh spend your your evenings is watching us so all right well thank you everybody for listening i really am appreciative thank you everybody for if you're a new listener i hope you stick around through well forever because we're not going anywhere (laughs) you are now officially a a slave to this show right like you if you don't hit that subscribe button you will ban you from the show and uh you can take that to the bank all right everybody thanks so much for listening as always take care i'll talk to you next time Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.